and welcome to the Archbishop's Corner. This is where we meet each week to talk with Hartford Archbishop Leonard Blair about faith, morals, the life of the church today, and how the gospel makes sense in an ever-changing world. This is where we go to find the answers to our lingering questions about the teachings of the church, living the faith life of a Catholic in contemporary society, and developing a stronger relationship with God. I'm Father John Gatzak, with many questions that you and I will ask Archbishop Blair as he responds to what matters to you in the Archbishop's Corner. God has not changed his address. God was not part of the urban flight or the rural revitalization program. God still lives where God has always lived, in your heart. God is still doing what God has always done, loving you. God is still who God has always been, the source and supply of all that you need and desire. God is still doing things in the only way that God has ever done anything, in the only way God can do anything, eternally. Some of us don't think God is still around because we haven't visited God in such a long time. With all the changes and challenges, ups and downs, additions and subtractions in our lives, our faith in God may have faded. Some of us may even have concluded that God has gone away and that there is absolutely no way to find God in the midst of all the pain, confusion, discontent, disharmony, and discord in our own lives. Nothing could be farther from the truth. God is still in the same place, in the midst of your need, being the same way, merciful and forgiving, for the same reason, love, under the same circumstances, waiting for you to acknowledge and accept how much you depend on God. In the Archbishop's Corner is where Hartford Archbishop Leonard Blair reminds us that God is still here and we still depend on God for all of life. It's a good reminder, one that we all need from time to time. So thank you, Archbishop Blair, for inviting us into the Archbishop's Corner, where your input will provide us with important keys to creating a more productive and positive relationship with God and His people. How are you today? Very well, thank you. You've got a busy schedule for this upcoming week, don't you? Well, what do they say? Which is worse, having too much to do or not enough? I've got plenty to do, and that's good. And it all revolves around education because, as we all know, we're coming to the end of another academic school year. So you'll be participating, I presume, in visiting some schools? Well, yes. I I don't know if it's connected with any particular observance, but um, one of the things I'm going to be having Mass in New Haven – at uh, St. Francis Church, but also there's a, a legacy brunch for Catholic education in New Haven. You know, they're, they're, the school there I just visited is doing very well. Uh, I mean, it represents a new initiative of, of a revitalization of the school there uh, because many of the schools over the last decades have closed. But this consolidation of education there is uh, doing very well. And I understand that um, 500 people have signed up to come to this lunch. Uh, because there's so many people in that area who are the products of Catholic education and who are very enthused about uh, making a go of it uh, in today's circumstances. And, willing to, and so, willing to continue to support Catholic education, right? Yes. And our Catholic education is doing very well. Uh, and I hate to say this because I take no satisfaction out of it, and, and actually it's, it's a sad thing. But the reality is that a lot of times in public education today, Many parents are finding uh, some dissatisfaction or difficulty, and uh, our enrollments are are very doing very well uh, for Catholic schools. And so I, and of course we 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 always say the most important thing for us is our motivation and the kind of formation we give our young people, uh, which is not just a private education, but it is a Catholic education, uh, and. Uh, all that that entails. So again, this is a, a very good initiative there in uh, New Haven. I'm also going to be visiting uh, another school uh, to St. Matthew's uh, later this week. And then the, it's the season of high school graduations, our Catholic sure. high school graduations. So I have a baccalaureate mass for East Catholic, and I know that Bishop Betancourt and I share this responsibility. He'll be having some of those masses too. Well, today is the 142nd anniversary of the founding of the American Red Cross, one of the nation's premier humanitarian organizations. And like so many institutions, organizations, and benevolent agencies, the Red Cross had its origins in Christian faith. The Christian faith of banker and businessman Harry Dunant 
was the impetus behind compassion that has been and continues to be extended to millions around the world. Now, right now, hundreds of American Red Cross disaster workers are on the ground in nine states providing comfort and support to people after deadly storms recently ripped across a large part of the South and Midwest. Anytime we hear about a disaster, a weather-related event, or some such emergency, you always hear of the presence of the Red Cross. Any thoughts to share on this occasion, Archbishop? Well, charity uh, doesn't discriminate by uh, religion or or race or, or country or anything. And I know even the Muslim countries have their, what they call the Red Crescent mm-hmm. that I think is inspired by the Red Cross for their their situation. But certainly the Red Cross is one of those agencies of aid and comfort to people in need that's very important. And as Catholics, of course, we have many of our own uh, societies, organizations that help as well. Not that, uh, you know, they're just for Catholics or the other just for non-Catholics. We all pitch in together to do our part. And when somebody is hurting, you don't ask them whether they're Catholic or Christian or whether they're a believer in God. You just offer the help that you can possibly offer, right? Yes. Wednesday is what's called Brother's Day, a time for men to celebrate successful brotherhood, biological, military, fraternal, or a lifetime experience showing just how amazing the brotherly connection can be. Is there a message from our archbishop to his brother priests that you would like to share, for instance? We call each other brother priests. I mean, why do we do that? Obviously, it it means something to be so connected together in this kind of a mission. Well, I mean, it goes back even prior to baptism that, you know, St. Paul says— uh, brothers and, and and sisters, we we use familiar terms to refer to one another, because we are part of the family of God, reborn. And there's first of all the the human family, uh, and then there is the family of faith through baptism, uh, and then within that there are various forms of uh, common life, whether it's a religious order, or sisters or brothers, or whether it's the priesthood. And so if it's the priesthood, it is, uh, you know, the pre- the bishop is said to be both a father and brother to his priests. Mm-hmm. And, of course, that's not an easy thing to do, to be father and brother. Sometimes one role or the other is at play. But the point is that uh, there's priestly fraternity, that priests are supposed to be, uh, they're not lone rangers, as we say, but they are called to a common ministry uh, with their bishop, uh, and that is genuinely fraternal. Thursday is National Missing Children's Day. It's a day promoting awareness of the problem of missing children. And believe it or not, it's estimated that some 2,300 children go missing every day in America. And as for the yearly estimate, the figure is 460,000. National Missing Children's Day was proclaimed by President Ronald Reagan back in 1983 to acknowledge the many children who go missing each and every year. From 1979 to 1981, a series of child abductions shook America, and it began with the disappearance of six-year-old Eaton Platts in New York City on May 25, 1979, while he was on his way to school from the bus. Eaton was unfortunately never found. Archbishop, how, how do you possibly bring comfort to the family of a missing child, huh? Well, you do, I don't know how you do, but the, but I think, sadly, you, we, the solution is to try to get to the root of the problem. Uh, now, I'm not saying about kidnapping, because that can happen to somebody in a very secure and, and safe family. But uh, when it comes to uh, children who are uh, lost or, or, you know, uh, a lot of it has to do with with the breakdown of family life. So there are a lot of children out there that don't have uh, a situation of... Uh, of a secure uh, home uh, economically or socially or emotionally. And, uh, you know, we try to pick up the pieces. Uh, the church does as best we can. But until you, you have uh, a solid family life, it becomes very difficult. Now, as far as children who simply are kidnapped or something like that, well, that's a horrible reality, and we just have to be uh, safe. And, you know, I mean, and not to be an old man about this, but when I was a kid growing up in Detroit— we kids went everywhere uh, and, you know, without danger. Sure, the only sure. rule we had was we had to be in back in the house when the street lights went on at night. But now, I, mean, I don't think kids even play like they used to uh, on their own out in the parks and everything. I can't really say. 
compared to those times. But we be, we're living in a much more fragmented and uh, and insecure and uh, sometimes dangerous world. It's very very sad. Well, on a much lighter note, Thursday is National Wine Day. In wine, an alcoholic beverage made from fermented grapes, I admit I enjoy wine. That, I believe, is a legacy of living and studying in Italy. As for red or white being my favorite, well, I guess it depends on my mood or the temperature and the angle of the sun hitting the earth. What about you, Archbishop? Well, when you said wine day, I was afraid you meant W-H-I-N-E, and I thought, oh, no, <laughs> no. we don't want any more whining. But... Uh, no, well, you know, wine, of course, is uh, one of the staples of of, of life uh, across many cultures, and certainly in Judaism and Christianity and the Bible, wine is uh, is something very important. And for us, it becomes the blood of Christ. So, what higher <laughs> reality can you have than that? Friday, May twenty sixth, is the memorial of Saint Philip Neri, an Italian priest known as the Apostle of Joy, and the third Apostle of Rome. Throughout his ministry, he stressed the importance of joy in the life of a disciple of Jesus. His own joy and humility attracted people from every walk of life to him and ultimately to Christ. He repeatedly said, Cheerfulness strengthens the heart and makes us persevere in a good life. Therefore, the servant of God ought always to be in good spirits. What are your thoughts? Well, yes, you know, I I mean, uh, cheerfulness uh, is... uh, a saintly virtue, uh, you know. It's not you're not supposed to be walking around dour, but uh, to to have the Jesus said, uh, you know, the night before he died to the apostles that uh, it was his joy that he gave to them, a joy that he said the world cannot take from you. And I find it very interesting, you know. I and our, our confirmation season is over now, but in my homily for the confirmations at the cathedral, I was saying how. Uh, you know, the world, the flesh, and the devil are out to get us, and the world today can be a very nasty place. Uh, and one of the commentators, uh, I didn't say in the homily who it was, but it was David Brooks in the New York Times, writing in the New York Times, was talking about the kinds of um, afflictions that our society is undergoing today. And he said that the result of all this is sadness, mm. that there's a sadness in the, in, in the society, in the world. It's a sadness among our young people. And, of course, in the homily, I say, this is the opposite of what Christ brings you through the gift of the Holy Spirit, uh, is joy. So this is very important. I mean, even when we are suffering, when we have uh, disappointments, crosses, difficulties, that should not take away from the joy we should have of knowing that Christ has conquered all these things. And if we take our cross up with him every day, we'll also uh, enjoy his resurrection, not just in the future, but even now. We can possess that joy that no one can take from us. And isn't it interesting that that St. Philip Neri was called the Apostle of Joy, probably meaning that he reflected on part of his mission as bringing joy into the life of others. And wouldn't that be nice if we looked at our own mission and ministry in life as being able to bring joy into the lives of others as well? Well, if we're making other people miserable, we really ought to go to confession because (laughs) something's not right. True. Let's take a look now at the road to happiness in life, and this is where we examine the wisdom of Pope Francis, drawn from some of his writings. I'll read a short portion of the Holy Father's address, and we'll ask you, Archbishop, to comment. This is taken from Pope Francis's Evangelii Gaudium, and is called Beware a Senseless Solitude. The Pope says, The great danger in today's world, overwhelmed as it is by an all-pervading consumerism, is the dissolution and anguish born of a complacent yet covetous heart, the feverish pursuit of frivolous pleasures, a blunted conscience. Whenever we are immersed in ourselves, there is no room for other people. We do not consider the poor. We no longer hear God's voice, no longer feel the quiet joy of his love, and our desire to do good fades. This is a very real danger for believers, too. Many people fall into this trap and become resentful, disgruntled, and listless. That is no way to live a dignified and fulfilled life. It is not what God wants for us, nor is it in keeping with the spirit that flows from the heart of the risen Christ. Archbishop, your thoughts. Well, uh, we just talked a moment ago about uh, what I was saying for my confirmation homily this year, 
This precise text that you just quoted from Evangelii Gaudium, I made the centerpiece of a confirmation homily a few seasons ago, a few mm. years ago. Mm. I think the Pope here is right on the head, hits the nail right on the head, that this all-pervading consumerism, the desolation and anguish born of a complacent yet covetous heart, you know, there's nothing wrong with living in the world and the material aspects of life and, you know, wanting to be successful, to have some financial security and to enjoy some of the, the good things of life. But when it becomes this all-pervading consumerism, as the Pope says, and it becomes an ism, uh, it becomes an ide- ideology, it becomes a, a driving uh, principle of, of what we do, uh, then the result is this desolation and anguish born of a covetous uh, heart, uh, feverishly pursuing frivolous pleasures. Because nothing in this world can ever satisfy the human heart. Only God can do that. You could be the master of the universe. You could be possess everything you could possibly imagine or desire, and you would not be happy. Because that's, as St. Augustine says, you have made us for yourself, Lord, and our hearts are ever restless until they rest in you. So I agree completely. I think the Pope has said it right on. Okay, let's take a look now at our gospel reading on this 21st day of May when the church celebrates the seventh Sunday of Easter. Our reading for today is taken from the 17th chapter of John's gospel, and after this dramatic presentation, we'll talk with you, Archbishop, about your thoughts. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven. Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that the Son may glorify thee, since thou hast given him power over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom thou hast given him. And this is eternal life, that they know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I glorified thee on earth, having accomplished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, Father, glorify thou me in thy own presence with the glory which I had with thee before the world was made. I have manifested thy name to the men whom thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them to me, and they have kept thy word. Now they know that everything that thou hast given me is from thee. For I have given them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them and know in truth that I came from thee. And they have believed that thou didst send me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom thou hast given me, for they are thine. All mine are thine, and thine are mine. And I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world. But they are in the world, and I am coming to thee. Archbishop, what inspiration do you take away from this gospel account? Well, interestingly, I had spoken earlier about the joy that Christ promised his apostles on the eve of his crucifixion. Mm -hmm. Well, this is part of that discourse. This is kind of a a rhapsody of of speech that Christ is giving uh, about uh, who he is and how he's come into the world and his concern— Uh, for those who the Father gave him in this world, which, by the way, includes all of us now, as it included those first apostles. So the words are are living words. They're spoken to us. You know, when Jesus says, I pray for them, he's not just talking about the apostles. He's talking about all of us. Pray for the ones you have given me, because they are yours. I have been glorified in them. Well, are are our lives such that that Jesus is glorified in our lives for the world to see? And not just for the world to see, but for our own sanctification, our own redemption, our own eternal joy, for our life to give glory to God. I think that's a wonderful way to understand the Christian life and what it means to be holy. You know, it's not just about moralism, uh, as important as uh, a discipline of life in keeping with the gospel is, because you have to, to live as Jesus taught us to live. But how often do we think about our life as giving glory to God? 
not just our words, but the way mm-hmm. we live giving glory to God. And how we do that is by striving every day to imitate Christ and to uh, keep his commandments, to keep his word. Uh, we're giving glory to God. So it's a really beautiful uh, uh, thing, not only as Christ prepares for his ascension into heaven, but also for all of us in our daily life. This this is a farewell of sorts. Jesus says he will no longer be in the world, but they are in the world while he is coming to the Father. To me, that sort of says that since he is no longer in the world, we need to take up some of the responsibility to make him present in the world. We are to be the presence of Christ in the world, to love, to be peacemakers, to heal, to comfort, and all the rest. Your thoughts on Mm -hmm. that? Well, of course, uh, Christ, uh, when he says, I will no longer be in the world, but they are in the world while I am coming to you, it it doesn't mean that Christ has left uh, the world, but he is no longer uh, present uh, uh, in his glorified body uh, as a, as compared to his ascension into heaven, where uh, he is present everywhere, mystically, sacramentally, especially, and in that sense, Christ is still in the world, but not in the same way. The agency of his presence now is his church. It is the sacraments to celebrate mass, to preach. When we preach the gospel, when we live the gospel, when we is saying that we are Christ's hands and feet in the world today. Well, there's truth to that. Yeah. Uh, Christ is present everywhere as the eternal Son of the Father, the second person of the Blessed Trinity. He's present in, in the Holy Eucharist and in the sacramental life of the Church. But he also needs to be present in us uh, in, in uh, carrying out the mission and the gospel that he left us. Let's look at some of the questions that have been submitted by our, our listeners. For instance, Carol from Bridgewater says, The Bible makes reference to God speaking from above and at the ascension of Jesus in Acts of the Apostles. It says he was lifted up and a cloud took him from their sight. The Gospel says, While they were looking intently at the sky as he was going, suddenly two men dressed in white garments stood beside them. They said, Men of Galilee, why are you standing there looking at the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will return in the same way as you have seen him going into heaven. We have sent people to the moon and know that there are satellites orbiting high up in the sky, so that can't be where heaven is. But doesn't it have to be a real place? Jesus ascended there, and his mother Mary was assumed body and soul. So, where is heaven? Well, Carol, we have to understand that heaven is not a material place. Heaven is something that transcends uh, the materiality of the, the world Uh, just as each of us walking around is made up of body and soul, but we can't see our souls. Um, When, uh, you know, for example, uh, well, in the scriptures itself, ascending upward and into the the heavens um, makes perfect sense from the point of view of of how we live and how we move in the world. But it doesn't mean that heaven is a physical place above us, you know, (laughs) When there there have been apparitions of Our Lady, for example, at Fatima and such, Mary doesn't come out of the ground. She she appears to to come from the heavens, and there are signs in the heavens. But again, that that is a transcendent reality that that doesn't mean that it's a physical physical place. Nancy from Madison has an interesting question. Nancy says, "I'm watching the news and see rude and hate-filled behaviors and people becoming normal, and I don't like it." I'm not perfect, but I do try to behave the way Jesus asks us to, loving another as myself. But I don't think that's going to change the world. Are church leaders going to respond to this decline in society? Well, I think we're trying to respond to it every day. I wrote an article uh, in the transcript some, I think, years ago about a book a professor had written called A Bee in the Bonnet, Anger in America Today. And it was his his study was that people in America have become very tolerant of of rude of behavior that in the past would have been considered rude and would have been censured, and now somehow you're asserting yourself in anger makes you some kind of credible person, which is not only not virtuous but it also is very dangerous because if we start. Uh, being uh, bullied and cowed by anger and trying to bully and cow other people by anger, what kind of world are we going to live in? It is a sign of decline in our society that uh, that there is so much anger and rudeness in the way people act. Uh, so 
you know, light a candle rather than cursing the darkness, first of all, we have to look to our own behavior. And secondly, we should not reward bad behavior. I mean, it sounds like the way we talk about uh, raising children, but to the extent that this kind of brutish anger and vulgarity is uh, not worthy of educated and civilized adult, we should censure it and we should not reward it. You're getting me all worked up here. I hope I'm not getting angry. Because <laughs> no, I, I think we all see your point and all subscribe to it. Yeah. Well, uh, well, all. I hope that our listeners do. So clearly not everybody does because there is a lot of brutish uh, conduct and, and uh, rude behavior in our society today, even at uh, places you wouldn't expect it. Also, in terms of the violence that we've seen in society, how many mass shootings have we seen already thus far this year? Well, anger and violence certainly go together. Mike from Beacon Falls says, Am I following the church's teaching on social justice if I am in favor of immigration laws being enforced? Well, Mike, that is a very timely question, and the answer is uh, yes. You, The church says that a country has a right uh, to defend its borders and a country has a right to regulate uh, immigration. But at the same time, the church also teaches that uh, in the world, people also have a right to emigrate, especially in places where there is violence or they're looking for uh, economic opportunity, that a country should have uh, reasonable uh, and just laws about immigration. So, uh, you, you, again, like with so many things, it's about creating the right balance. Uh, it, it, the church doesn't teach that, you, that a country cannot have immigration laws to regulate immigration, but neither should a country just say, no, we don't want to allow anybody in here uh, who wants to come into our country. We should be uh, open to that possibility, uh, but regulated uh, and, uh, uh, you know, with the right kind of balance. Sadly, in our country, I know that presidents have been talking about immigration reform for years uh, and yet it gets gridlocked in Washington, and there's no resolution to it, which is very, very, very sad indeed. Chris from Bloomfield says, I recently read the portion of the gospel about what will happen at the end of time. It stated, quote, But of that day or hour no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Did Jesus not have unrestricted knowledge? Well, I think you have to believe Jesus and what he says. If that's what Jesus says, it's what he said, that in his uh, that um, in th- this tremendous mystery of the Most Holy Trinity, there's something Jesus is saying to us that is reserved to th- his Heavenly Father in this mysterious manner. And so we have to uh, accept that, that teaching. Accepting that teaching, does it mean that we live our lives as if today we're going to be our last day on earth. Well, I think, yeah, uh, you know, the old memento mori, the remembrance of death, it was considered in, in uh, Christian piety to be a healthy attitude to have, not to be morbid or uh, lugubrious about it, but simply to acknowledge that, uh, you know, we should, we should live our life in, in light of the four last things, uh, death, judgment, heaven, or hell. Those are the four last things of Christian catechesis, uh, the certainty of it, of death, judgment, heaven, or hell. And we're always uh, not not in fear, uh, although sometimes maybe uh, a healthy fear of sin and evil is a good thing if it's healthy, just as uh, having a good, uh, healthy sense of what is dangerous in life uh, to preserve our well-being is healthy and make our life accordingly. Archbishop, we've come to the end of our time together. Can you close our program with a prayer and a blessing, please? Lord, in these days when we await the gift of the Holy Spirit, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, we pray that for ourselves and for the Church and for all of our intentions at this time, that united mystically and spiritually with Mary and the Apostles in the Upper Room, we may implore the gift of the Holy Spirit for peace and work in our world, Uh, for justice, uh, and for a great, great renewal of faith. And uh, we make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. And, And may Almighty God bless you all, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Archbishop, thank you for inviting us into the Archbishop's Corner. It's been enjoyable being with you um, and learning your thoughts. We uh, anticipate coming back again next week with you. And until then, have a good week. You too. Thank you. Thank you.